Watch this. More big-name Republicans refusing to partake in political debates. The latest non-participant, our lieutenant governor, who would like to be governor. Boise is home to the famous blue turf and the luckiest gas station in the country, apparently. How one single location helped make several Idahoans millionaires overnight, thanks to the Powerball. It's one way to make it from the bench to the Basque block without getting your feet wet. Where it's at is where it's been for decades. You know, spring can be a tough time for those who suffer from seasonal allergies. And apparently, you can add debates to that list of allergens, at least for a growing number of Republican candidates who seem to be avoiding them these days, like political pollen. Lieutenant Governor Janice McGeehan is the latest to not want to participate, except she didn't exactly say no, she just didn't say yes. McGeehan never responded to multiple requests to participate in the KTVB Republican debate for governor. Here's what happened. When we started planning for our debate several weeks ago, we reached out to all qualified GOP candidates to find a date and time that would work best for them. And that included Governor Little, Lieutenant Governor Janice McGeehan, and Ed Humphreys. Humphreys said he was in. McGeehan's campaign told us she was waiting to see if Little signed on before deciding if she would. So we asked Little to let us know before 5 o'clock last Friday afternoon. Then around 4 on Friday, Governor Little let us know and other media outlets he would not be participating in any debates because his record as governor is, quote, non-debatable. The first time in nearly three decades, a sitting governor has declined to participate in a re-election debate. So Humphrey's in, little out. Knowing that, we let McGeehan know we would like to know by 5 p.m. Monday. Yesterday, whether to prepare for a two-candidate debate or, well, none at all. That deadline came and went last evening without so much as a word from McGeehan's campaign. However, she has certainly been vocal about the debates the last few days. On Friday, she posted, she posted on Twitter, we have received confirmation that Mr. Little's refusing to participate in the debate, pointing out IPTV's admission is not a scheduling issue, but a want to issue on the governor's behalf. Once again, he is showing his elitist attitude by refusing to address his record, she said. Then yesterday morning, a few hours before her deadline, she tweeted again, saying Mr. Little says he doesn't need to debate because his record speaks for itself. This is precisely why he needs to debate. His record is indefensible, yet he refuses to answer for it in front of the people. Lots to say there, obviously, just nothing to say to those waiting for a response. So unless something changes quickly, there will be no debate for governor before the Republican primary in about a month. But there are going to be several other debates going on as scheduled, including one tonight for the Republican candidates for attorney general which will feature incumbent Lawrence, uh, incumbent Lawrence Wasden, former Congressman Raul Labrador, and Art McEmber. You can watch that on Idaho Public Television or on their YouTube page starting at 8 o'clock this evening. Morgan Romero, our Morgan Romero, will be one of the panelists on that debate. And coming up on Monday night, KTV and IPTV will host a debate between the Rep Republican candidates for state superintendent. So stay tuned for that. Now back to the deadlines and our lieutenant governor's aversion to them. There was another one missed by McGeehan yesterday. She had until Monday to respond to requests from the Idaho Division of Financial Management on how she wanted to handle some specifics regarding balancing her office's budget, including how to pay for health insurance premiums, her own. Because you may remember, her office is more than two grand, two grand in the red. In an email last week, she called the process, quote, a pointless formality, adding, that DFM already had her account information and they can take the necessary funds out of that account if they need to. But it's not quite that simple. She did eventually respond to DFM, sort of, this morning after the deadline. She gave an answer on how she wanted vendor payments to be handled. That money will come out of her salary, she said, making her about $2,600 over budget for the year. And that money will come out of her salary. But she failed to give any specifics on health insurance. Alex Adams with the Division of Financial Management, Management says should she not respond, she could lose her state provided health insurance until the start of the next fiscal year, which comes up on July 1st. So is she legally obligated to figure this out and let them know about it? Yeah, yes, she is. And that could mean more legal trouble if she doesn't. But at this point, we're told they just want to figure it all out. Not participating in debates apparently opens up one schedule for more time to tweet. Yesterday afternoon, Lieutenant Governor McGeehan put this out there 
into the social media realm. Thousands of Idaho Dems have registered as Republicans so they can vote for Brad Little and other rhinos in the GOP primary. Worse still, when asked directly, Brad refuses to condemn this subversion. Conservatives must turn out and vote in record numbers to rebuff the left, she said. So this is something we took a look at a couple weeks ago. And the claim Idaho Dems have registered as Republicans, well, that can certainly be backed up by the latest data. The Secretary of State's office put out their latest numbers on registered voters in Idaho. We were working off old numbers from January a couple weeks ago, but April's numbers show about a 2% or 2,000 increase in Idahoans registering to vote. An increase of about 0.3%. In January, there were about 134, 908 registered Democrats and 531,420 registered Republicans statewide. By April, those numbers changed a bit, with Democratic voters decreasing by about 4%, while the number of Republicans increasing almost by 3%. And if we do it by county, like we did two weeks ago, and we look at Ada, Kootenai, and Blaine County, we can update those numbers as well. There were about 296,263 registered voters in Ada County. The breakdown is on your screen. Now, we jump ahead to April. Ada County gained about 1,000 voters overall. Democrats during that time lost 5% of voters, unaffiliated lost 3%, and Republicans, well, they gained more than 5%. In Kootenai County, it's the Coeur d'Alene area up north, slight movements all around, registered voters increasing by about 330 from January to April, Democrats losing more than 2.5%, while Republicans gained nearly 2% over that time. Unaffiliated voters were also down slightly. Finally, over in Blaine County, which could be considered the bluest county in Idaho, more than 100 voters registered in the county from January to April. GOP voters grew by more than 14% in Blaine County, while registered Democrats, well, that shrunk, about 4%. And there could be some more changes come Election Day because unaffiliated voters, they can still register as Republicans at the polls during the primary. Republicans have gained a lot more registered voters in the last couple of months. That is true. As to why, well, that part is debatable. Is it in order to have some say in who runs on the GOP ticket come November? Maybe. But these are the rules set up by lawmakers and political parties. So it's kind of tough to complain about the rules or even condemn them just because you may not like the outcome. All right, day two of city council hearing Interfaith, Interfaith Sanctuary's appeal uh, has ended. Yesterday, council members heard from city staff, they heard from Interfaith itself and neighborhood associations on their arguments about the appeal for a conditional use permit, which was originally denied. Well, today, they started the days to come uh, public testimony. There'll be several of them, and Katya Stepovic has been listening in all day long. Katya? Well, Brian, we heard a lot of the same arguments that we've been hearing for over a year now, but something that a lot of people have not focused on is what is the what if factor, specifically what will happen if city council denies interface appeal? The simple act of adding over 205 extremely low income persons to a small neighborhood with over 30% poverty already has a dramatic effect on increasing economic segregation and the concentration of poverty. My home faces River Street and is a main thoroughfare between River of Life and Corpus Christi. I have not seen one needle, condom, human waste or the like in my walkabouts. Nothing has been stolen from my front porch or out of my garage. Sometimes people walk by talking to themselves. Mostly it's someone Bluetoothing a conversation into earbuds. Sometimes it's not harmless either way. This project is approved. No small child will be as safe as they are currently. No young mother with a baby will feel as safe in a park or on a green bill. I don't think there's a better alternative. If you lose the services of Interfaith Sanctuary, uh, you wind up with people who are homeless on the streets um, and without any services provided to them. That's a much more unmanageable and difficult situation than the one you might have, might, uh, with a shelter on State Street. Yeah, so it's hard to predict what the outcome of all this could be. And the question is, what is the alternative? And is there one? Interfaith owns the Salvation Army building. So if they are denied, they would likely have to sell it entirely and start this entire process all over again. Brian. And that starts a whole other domino process because as we you had talked about earlier, 
if they don't get in now and have to start over a year from now, there's a possibility there is a rule being talked about at City Hall that could, well, change the way they go at it when it comes to a building, right? Yeah, it's that zoning code and the language will change potentially if they vote on it to, no, to not allow any shelter within 300 feet of a residential area. So this would no longer be a zone that they could operate in at all. All right, so a lot more testimony coming up over the next couple of days. Thank you very much, Katya. Your odds of winning the Powerball? Yeah, not so great. But your chances may improve if you happen to pick your numbers at this Boise gas station, considered the luckiest in the country. And just up the road from that spot sits this spot, paying homage to pioneers as they made their way west. Any guesses where it's at today? You can send those guesses via text message to the number on your screen, 208-321-5614. Don't forget your name and the hashtag, the 208. If you're not sure, that's all right. We'll have some more hints as we get further into the show, but feel free to use that number to send us any questions or comments you have about today's show. As you know, we're going to share a few at the end. Well, we're celebrating a big happy birthday to Powerball. Big ball, right? Popular lottery game turns 30 years old today. I'm sure many of you played at some point in your life, right? Probably won something, maybe. I don't know, a dollar or two? How's that work, Joe? We get a couple out of this? Yeah. In the 30-year history of the Powerball, 36 Idahoans have won prizes that have made them millionaires. One man still owns the Idaho record for biggest payout. Way back in 2005, Brad Duke won more than $220 million on Powerball. It was nearly 10 years after that, Pam Hyatt won about $90 million from Powerball. And do you know this? They bought their tickets at the same gas station in Boise. Yes, the numbers of that happening, highly improbable. Because of that, the Jacksons on Orchard is known as the luckiest store in America. Well, to mark the 30th birthday of Powerball, Joe Paris visited the luckiest store in America and revisited the memories Brad Duke had of winning the big one, the Powerball jackpot. It's a celebration at a gas station for one round red regular. It's 30 years for Mr. Powerball. On April 19, 1992, a new lottery game, Powerball, sold its first tickets. And over the last 30 years in Idaho, Powerball has sold close to $900 million in tickets in the gem state. Idahoans have won more than $595 million in prizes while also contributing about $400 million in dividends to benefit Idaho public schools and buildings. In 2005, Idahoan Brad Duke bought a Powerball ticket that would go on to be one of the biggest winners ever. And as a part of the Powerball celebration, Mr. Duke sat down with KTVB to reminisce about a dream so many have fantasized about, winning the lottery. Who was I before? Duke was working in management for a Treasure Valley Gold's gym and was passionate about his career path. Even before winning $220 million, Duke felt he was on a great path towards success. I really didn't think things could get better for me, and I remember thinking that, and within that week, this happened. Duke won one of the largest Powerball prizes to date, from the exact same gas station that Idahoan Pam Hyatt won her Powerball jackpot from a decade earlier. So, who was the first person Mr. Duke called? 
Well, it was his dad. Dad, sit down and prepare for some life-changing news. And he says, oh, you're getting married. And I said, no. And he goes, well, you must be that guy that won the lottery. Duke recalls still working at Gold's Gym right after he won the millions. He did have to leave shortly after because of all the attention and distractions coming their way. And the phones were ringing off the hook at, 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 a, at some point that had nothing to do with inquiries about the business. So, um, But I, I think I, I kept teaching spin class for over a year. Wow. Yeah, so I was still showing up and working twice a week on some level for well over a year. Duke took a lump sum payout from his big win that, by the way, was a double win. Did you know this? Duke got first and third prize on the same ticket. But what to do with millions of dollars? Best part of winning, being able to give back, is, as in, in my retrospect, has been the best part. Duke has worked to donate and contribute to Idaho communities through the Duke Family Foundation. Another passion for Duke, helping Idaho youth. Our biggest partners are always youth mentoring programs, and, and the notion behind, behind that is sometimes kids can't pick their own circumstance, but if you can influence a better circumstance for a kid and they go on to do something great, it's, it's kind of the pay it forward thing uh, that, that me and my family and my board really buy into, and, and that's our focus. The money, as you can imagine, is of course incredible. How could it not be? Could you even make up what you would do in your head with all that money? Well, Duke says, without being cliche, though, there is something from his journey that still brings him the most joy. We didn't have a lot when we grew up, um, but for, for my parents to look upon what we've done in our family name is, and to see how proud my dad is, is, um, is as good as the projects itself at times. <laughs> Lots more plans. Okay, so some of us have been around long enough to remember when yes. Allison Newton talked to Brad Duke. When he won that, he was in hiding for a bit. But then he said he has even bigger plans. Like he said back then that he wanted to turn that $220 million into a billion dollars. How close is he? He hasn't done it. And actually, we talked to him about that on Friday. And we asked, well, do you plan on still doing this? And he said, yes, it's still part of his top three priorities in life is to turn his, his earnings and all his work into a billion dollars. He hasn't done it yet, but... Uh, I guess, fingers crossed, maybe he'll get to do it. I think it's so interesting, Brian, and you know the story going back to 2005. Mr. Duke, actually, he actively tried to win the Powerball using different patterns and mm -hmm. strategies to get out there and get the best combination. I think it's really interesting to me, and maybe I should have mentioned this. So he wins $220 million on the ticket. Two lines down, as we showed you, he was still a $10,000 winner. Yeah. So he has a system. Clearly, it worked for him. I, I have my own system, Brian. I just print the money myself. You just print it out yourself. Joe Bucks. How often does he play? Now? I don't know. Okay, because I'm going to say, we're all kind of working on a billion dollars. I mean, but yeah. if he hasn't won since, that formula might need to be a little tweaked. Might be. Well, I think he's also trying to build the... Anyways. That's true. All well, right, look, thanks, Joe. Look for some Joe Bucks out there. <laughs> Joe Bucks. At the time of its completion, it was called a masterful work of art. Today, it's just likely a better way to get from point A to point B. Where it's at? Well, it might help to know what it's over. I right, get in your final guesses by sending us a text. The number is on your screen, 208-321-5614. As always, you can use that number to send us anything else that's on your mind. But try to keep them short and sweet, because that's the best way to get them on at the end of the show. Oh, yeah, and don't forget your name and the hashtag, the 208.
All right, we come to the point in the show where we reveal where it's at. You know, we've been showing you pieces and parts spread across the past 20 minutes or so. And we've seen your guesses. No, it's not victory. Last week, Chi sent us a text message with these pictures. A white five-span bridge, he said, crossing the Boise River, looks Art Deco-ish. Fairview Bridge, Chi called it. Very beautiful and long for the time. Said it was designed and built by MK, Morrison Knudsen. And he's right about most of that. That is a picture, and those are pictures of Fairview Bridge, the one you used to get into Boise instead of using the connector. And it is a five-span bridge, and it was built in 1932. Its length of 378 feet is pretty long, even for that day. It was posted to the National Register of Historic Places in 1990. But it wasn't built by Morrison Knudsen. However, saying that name and then calling out the bridge's beauty did make us think of another Boise bridge that was built by MK. About a mile or so upriver spans the Capitol Boulevard Memorial Bridge, or where it's at today. It was built a year before the Fairview Bridge was built and was supposed to be the final piece of a grand entrance into the capital city. It was also called the Oregon Trail Memorial Bridge at first when it was first built, a tribute to the pioneers who made their way through Boise and apparently crossed the river at this point. But the account of its construction was a pretty good tale as well. There was a plan, there was a denial of that plan, and there was the kick in of some federal cash, and the job got done in record time. The idea was to build Boise's Grand Boulevard, a park-like approach to the state capitol for visitors dropped off at the train depot. And to build it, well, they needed a bridge over the river. But when they brought a construction bond to Boise voters in 1927, they said no. Getting the U.S. Bureau of Public Roads involved gave them the green light. And that set local engineering firm Morrison Knudsen in motion. They took Charles Kyle's Art Deco design and hired 100 men to make it happen. Starting with the first pour of concrete on February 20th, 1931, those 100 men worked every day for 16 hours a day, according to the Idaho Statesman, and finished the four arches by April 18th. The floor, 11 days later, just 68 days after they started. In May of that year, just before it was open to traffic, the Idaho Statesman wrote, six months ago, a dream. Today, a completed structure. Well, kind of. All that was left were the handrails, the artwork, and a general polishing to be put on it, and the Oregon Trail Memorial Bridge was done, 60 days ahead of schedule. It was dedicated that September, Tuesday the 15th, 1931. And as the reporter put it, the bridge and the boulevard form an approach to the city which is unequaled for stark beauty and simple grandeur by any bit of man-made highway in the West. It was built before the Golden Gate Bridge, by the way. The four-lane Capitol Boulevard Memorial Bridge is 310 feet long and hasn't really changed much over the years, other than the deck being redone in 1987 and the whole bridge getting a makeover in 2013 just in time for this city's sesquicentennial celebration. It was also added to the National Register of Historic Places in 
Final minute of the show and PJ summing up the primary season almost perfectly here. The numbers pretty much speak for themselves. In a very red state, Democrats want to say on who is on the Republican ticket, especially for governor and lieutenant governor. So register as a Republican. Just saying it happened. Democracy by the rules. I'm one of those people who changed my affiliation to Republican because my values more closely follow them. And I'm hoping that my one vote will quiet someone, says Anna Lee. Why does the public think homeless people are predators and criminals? They're people just like us and need a place to live. We get a lot of that during that uh, hearing at City Council or City Hall down in Boise this past week. Did McGeehan pay her lawyers with her budget? If this is the case, doesn't mean she owes more than 2300 Yes, Alan, she did, but that's why she had to get rid of some staff. She basically is in the office by herself, but that kind of was why she's left with in the red of $2,600. Just want to say a big thank you to the person who prepaid $100 at the gas pump at Chevron on Gowan Saturday. Much appreciated. There is still some good out there, and we love hearing about it. That's awesome. Have a great day.